flowing southward from its source in the mountainous area where Israel, Syria and Lebanon meet, the Jordan River passes through the Sea of Galilee and then flows further south into the Dead Sea. The Jordan River runs through the land and history of the Bible. Why was the Jordan River an important symbol to folk, gospel, spiritual music, poetry and other literary works? Come with me on a journey to the Jordan River and the Judean Desert, the quest for answers, looking for Jesus in the Holy Land begins right now. The Jordan River is the largest and most important river in Palestine. The name Jordan comes from the Hebrew word descender because of the way it descends from its sources. The Jordan is the world's lowest river, flowing well below sea level for most of its course. Although it starts at more than 305 meters above sea level, it ends at 395 meters below. A large part of its 320 kilometer length forms the border between Israel and Jordan in the north and the West Bank and Jordan in the south. Although the river is not navigable, its waters are valuable for irrigation. The Jordan figures prominently in events recorded in the Bible. It is first mentioned in the Old Testament, in the account of Abram and Lot. When the two decided to separate, Lot chose to take his herds to the rich plain of the Jordan. Later, Jacob crossed the river on his journey to Aram. The Jordan was the final obstacle facing the Israelites before they could enter into the Promised Land. Moses' dying wish was to cross the river, and to do so was Joshua's first command from the Lord. The miraculous dry crossing of the Jordan opened the way for the destruction of Jericho and the subjugation of the Canaanites. Some of the stories of Elijah and Elisha are set in the Jordan Valley. There they and their disciples gathered and in that vicinity the two prophets performed a number of miracles. The Jordan is also the backdrop for events recorded in the Gospels. John the Baptist came out of the wilderness to baptize in the Jordan and it was there that Jesus was baptized. During part of his public ministry, Jesus traveled along the eastern bank of the river and he crossed at Jericho as he began his final journey to Jerusalem. Any person who has chosen to cross the Jordan River at Jericho towards Jerusalem is bound to face the Judean Desert. The Judean Desert is bordered by the mountains to the west, by the Jordan Valley, and the Dead Sea to the east. It is considered a relatively small desert spanning only 1,500 square kilometers. The desert is known for its rugged landscape, which has provided refuge and hiding place for rebels and zealots, as well as solitude and isolation to monks and hermits. David frequently found shelter in various parts of the wilderness when fleeing from Saul. During the days of the Maccabeans, about 2,000 years ago, large fortresses such as Masada and Horcania were established in the desert. Several decades ago, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered hidden in a cave in Qumran, which shed light on the Bible and on the period during which they were written. John the Baptist preached here, and it seems likely that this was the wilderness where Jesus was tempted. Other rivers have more beauty. Many are longer, most are cleaner but none has gathered as much affection as the Jordan River. Jesus was about 30 years old when he heard about the wilderness prophet who was baptizing people in the River Jordan. Closing the door to his carpenter shop and bidding his mother farewell, Jesus made his way to the river. 
All roads leading to the Jordan were crowded with people going to listen to the fiery preaching of John the Baptizer. The Bible says people from Jerusalem and from all of Judea and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. Now, John the baptizer was a rugged individual who appeared in the wilderness of Judea, boldly preaching repentance. By the way, the verb repent means to feel sorry for your sins and to turn away from them. Thousands of people went out to the Jordan to hear John preach. Many of them chose to repent and get baptized. John immersed them in the water as a sign that their sins were washed away. By the way, John and Jesus were related. John was the son of Elizabeth, who was Mary's relative. When Jesus showed up at the Jordan River, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. By calling Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John was declaring that Jesus Christ would be the sacrifice for your sins and mine. Jesus would ultimately lay down his life on the cross so that you and I can be totally forgiven for all of our sins. Every lamb that had ever been sacrificed as a sin offering pointed forward to Jesus, the true Lamb of God. Let's read the account of Jesus' baptism found in Matthew 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. John certainly recognized that Jesus had no sinful past to confess. He was sinless. But Jesus wanted to leave us the right example to follow. So, according to Christ's request, John immersed him in the Jordan. He fully submerged Jesus in the water. And as soon as Jesus came up out of the water, the Spirit of God descended like a dove and rested upon him. Then God the Father spoke from heaven those powerful words of affirmation. This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Wow! How would you like to hear your Heavenly Father speak those same words to you? In a very real way, each person who gets baptized receives this same affirmation. When you choose to follow Jesus in baptism, your Father will speak those same words to your heart. I'll never forget the day I was baptized. I was 18 years old. I had made a lot of mistakes in my years of teenage rebellion. And as I committed my life to God in baptism, I had the beautiful sense that all my sins were washed away. I sensed that my Heavenly Father was saying to me, You are my son. I love you, and I am so pleased with you. I'll never forget that day. If you've not yet been baptized by immersion, I encourage you to take that step as soon as you have a personal faith in Christ and repent of your sins. You'll want to get to know the basic teachings of Jesus before you take this beautiful step of baptism. But don't feel that you need to be perfect before you get baptized. Baptism doesn't mean you're perfect. It just means you're committed, committed to Jesus. Immediately after his baptism, Jesus went into the wilderness, the desert, to be alone with God and to pray. His baptism was the beginning of his public ministry. Before he started preaching and teaching and healing, Jesus sensed the need to spend some significant time in prayer. In fact, uh, he didn't eat anything for several weeks. He was fasting and praying and seeking God's blessing on his ministry. It was in that setting that Satan chose to bring some very significant temptations to Jesus. By the way, the Bible teaches that there is a real devil. He doesn't have a pointy tail and a pitchfork. He's actually a fallen angel. And the Bible says he managed to trick one-third of the angels of heaven into following him and rebelling against God. So the devil, or Satan as he is called, is very clever. He's a deceiver. In 1 Peter 5, we're warned, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. 
he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, the devil's had a lot of experience tempting people over the years. He knows a thing or two about how to lead people away from God and into sin. Often the devil will tempt us when we're at our weakest moment. This is what he did with Jesus. By the way, often the devil will bring strong temptations to new believers right after their baptism. That's what he did with Jesus. Of course, after fasting for 40 days, Jesus was very weak. The Bible says he was hungry. Notice how the devil tempted Jesus. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The devil is very sneaky. He whispered into Jesus' ear, If you are the Son of God. He was trying to get Jesus to question his identity. What did the Father say at his baptism? You are my son whom I love. Now Satan is insinuating that he may not be God's son after all. Friend, never forget who you are. You are a daughter of God. You are a son of God. Never forget it. So Satan tempted Jesus to turn stones into bread. It's no sin to be hungry, but the devil was trying to get Jesus to use his divine power to satisfy his own needs. Did you notice how Jesus met this appetite temptation? He quoted scripture. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Friend, life is always best when we choose to follow the word of God. Make the Bible your daily study. And when Satan tempts you, the Holy Spirit will bring scripture to your mind. But Satan didn't give up. He tempted Jesus again. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands, they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Notice, the devil can quote scripture too. Friend, the devil knows his Bible much better than either you or I do. Of course, he usually twists it or uses verses out of context. At any rate, the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem, set him on the highest part of the temple roof, and told him to throw himself down because the angels would protect him. Jesus replied once more by quoting scripture. He said, it is not right to put God to the test. It's not right to presume on God's goodness by putting yourself in harm's way. A third and final time, the devil tempted Jesus. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Friend, ultimately what Satan really wants is your worship. Satan offered Jesus all the riches and power and glory of this world if only Jesus would worship him. Today, Satan tempts us the same way by offering all that this world has to offer if we will just worship him. But Jesus answered once again with those famous words, it is written. Friend, there is power in the Bible to give us victory over the temptations of the devil. It is written, Jesus said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Three temptations, appetite, presumption, and the things of this world. I've noticed that whenever I'm tempted, the temptation falls into one of those three areas. And though I know Jesus is able to keep me from sin, too often I give in to temptation. I'm so grateful that when I confess my sin, I have a loving Savior who forgives me. The Bible promises in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friend, Jesus is faithful. It is not his will that we should sin. But when we do sin, 
And when we confess it, he forgives us and cleanses us from all sin, all sin. I need to emphasize this. There is no sin that God will not forgive when you confess it and ask him to forgive you. That's the amazing grace of God. When two people love each other and want to spend the rest of their lives together, when they are committed to each other, they get married. In the same manner, when people love Jesus and want to follow Him as His disciples and are committed to Him, they get baptized. The book of Acts continuously stresses the sequence of hearing the proclamation of the gospel, believing in Jesus, and being baptized. For instance, let's read Acts chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed, Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Christian baptism is rooted in Jesus who himself was baptized and who gave the commission to baptize those who desire to become God's children. However, his own baptism was not a baptism of repentance. He was baptized as our example. Baptism has to do with repentance of sin and dedicating one's life to Jesus. Baptism was therefore to do with cleansing and is a sign of accepting forgiveness and salvation. Baptism is by water and the Holy Spirit depicting death to sin and bringing about newness of life. Baptism is a public act of confessing Christ and believing in Him. Baptism has to do with discipleship and allows Jesus to live his life in his followers. We are challenged as Paul was when he met Jesus. And now, why do you delay? Get up, be baptized, and have your sins washed away, calling on his name. But we should not expect that either before or after we commit our lives to Jesus through baptism, we will experience a bed of roses. Jesus has alerted us. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus never promised that life would be easy, but he promised that we, he would never leave nor forsake us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So what are the keys to overcoming trials, tribulations, and temptations? Seek Jesus in prayer. The Bible states that Jesus is available all the time. He understands what you face. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Study the Word. The Word of God has always been our best defense against Satan's temptations and trials. Christ overcame his temptations by quoting the Bible. Indeed, Christians need to be diligent in studying God's Word. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies. Keep the kingdom of God in mind. The psalmist wrote, Weaving may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. One day the tribulations and trials will be past, and the glory will be an eternal reality. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us.
Louisa Fletcher once wrote, I wish that there were some wonderful place called the land of beginning again, where all our mistakes and all our heartaches and all of our poor selfish grief could be dropped like a shabby old coat at the door and never put on again. Have you ever wished you could bury the past, wipe out the mistakes and guilt, and start over again? That is what baptism is all about. It is God's way of giving us that opportunity. When the baptismal candidate repents and confesses his sins, he is lowered beneath the water, a symbol of death and burial of the old life of self and sin. Then he is raised up out of the watery grave to a new life in Christ. What could more beautifully symbolize death to sin and the beginning of a new life than baptism by immersion? The River Jordan has been a place of transition for many people. Elisha, Joshua, Jesus. It has been a place of transition for many who have chosen to commit their lives to Jesus. Many pilgrims have been baptized in the River Jordan as well. Baptism, like the River Jordan, is all about a transition. A transition to a new life in Jesus Christ. If you have never been baptized by immersion, I invite you to take this very meaningful step. If you've received Jesus as your forgiver and leader, if you've repented of your sins, and if you're familiar with the basic teachings of Jesus, then you are ready to be baptized. I invite you to contact the pastor and make plans for your special day. What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. Jesus said that it was to our advantage that he should go away. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon God's people and the blessing of his presence is ours to enjoy. Our God loves us too much to leave us to face the struggles of life alone. When we pray, angels and the greatest gift he could give, the Holy Spirit are mobilized to help us in our battle with sin. I'm thankful for God's leading and interest in my well-being. Please set me free is a prayer that I often sing. It is my response to the prompting of God's grace. It's an invitation for God to lead me and to partner with me each and every day. Holy Spirit, please set me free. Take my heart, refashion me with your love. Love from above. Take my hand and draw oh so near. Teach me, Lord, I just long to hear of your love. Love from above. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, please come and teach me of thy will. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, please come and fill me, say you will. I long to feel your tender love so graciously Holy Spirit, please set me free Take my heart, refashion me with your love Love from above Holy Spirit, please set me free. Holy Spirit, please set me free. Holy Spirit.
spirit, please set me free. Thank you, Pastor Ron, for that beautiful song. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have lived an example for us and that you have also given an example through baptism. Lord, we pray that we'll make a decision to follow you with all of our hearts. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us to take a decision to also follow you in baptism. Lord, this is our prayer. And we pray that you will strengthen us so that we will daily follow you no matter what. We pray for these things and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear friend, thank you so much for watching us today. Don't forget to share the quest for answers, looking for Jesus in the Holy Land with your friends and relatives. Please visit our website. On our website, you can leave us a message, your prayer request, and order a copy of today's show or the complete series. If you feel moved to support our ministry, you can make your donation on our website as well. I hope to see you again soon. Until then, remember, Jesus is the Messiah.